Eli Collins is the chief technologist at Cloudera. Eli, thanks for coming on Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me. What is Cloudera? So Cloudera, we're a software company. We're based in Silicon Valley, but we've got offices all over the world. And our mission is to help organizations leverage the power of all, all their data. So we're, we're a software company um, with that aim. In a software engineering radio interview with Philip Zeliger, he said that Hadoop has more knobs and more parameters to tune than he would prefer. Does Hadoop have an excess of configurability? <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say it has an excess. I think it, it's had an excess of user-facing complexity. And one of the reasons uh, that we created Cloud Air Manager you know, four or five years ago was to uh, hide all of that complexity from from the user. So, it, you know, to some extent, if you've got a complex distributed system, um, you know, with a, with a lot of attributes that you had in the, the old school parallel computing and HPC environment, you know, it, it's fundamentally a complex environment. And so, to some extent, you know, removing the complexity by removing the ability to configure it uh, would make things easier, but probably isn't what what people want. And so, um, you know, I think. What people want is to be able to adopt something that's that complex, but do it in a far easier fashion. And so that's that's what we've you know, attempted to do. How does Cloudera affect the interaction between business teams and data science teams? So often the data science teams are actually in service of the business teams. So I don't know that we we um, impact that interaction uh, that much in the sense that if, if you think of someone in a data science team as someone who understands a little bit about the business domain, um, you know, a bit about uh, statistics and a bit about software engineering and kind of that, that magical combination. Um, I think they're inherently interested in uh, solving problems that are interesting to the business. So if, if I speak for our own internal data science team that tackles kind of Cloudera's data problems, um, you know, they, they are integrate quite well with the business and, and that we use our own software internally for all of our customer data, um, and which we use for proactive and predictive support. Um, and the, you know, it's funny, the mission of the business and that data science team are, are really, um, you know, they're really gelled. So is that, is the process there like these, are, this is where in Cloudera the most dog fooding of the product happens? Oh uh, yeah, this is the, so we dog food the product in a number of areas. This is the part of the company where if our own software failed, uh, we are, our customer facing, some of our customer facing processes would fail. So we treat this cluster uh, this cluster is a, is a user-facing production environment, and we actually upgrade it with our latest bits before um, we give them. The customers is kind of the last uh, stage of, of looking at a release before it goes out the door. But yeah, if this, if this cluster goes down, um, it's, it would be bad news bears for, for our business. And um, it also has a lot of customer sensitive customer data, so we have to you know, secure it and, and treat it um, uh, as you would any production cluster. How has your conception of the Cloudera product changed since the founding of Cloudera? You know, we've, we've always, so the, the original company was to do actually uh, Hadoop as this cloud service. That was, Cloudera was founded uh, with that premise. It was called CCS Cloudera Cloud Services. Um, within around six months, we pivoted to what we do now, which is providing uh, a, a Hadoop-based data platform. Um, and obviously adjacent services like professional services, training, um, support and so on. Uh, so that so that's been pretty stable. And that kernel, it, obviously, the the platform's got a lot bigger. So when we started, you know, CDH one was two versions of Hadoop and Pig and Hive, and now we've got twenty five some odd components in the platform. We've got you know proprietary cluster management tool called Cloudera Manager, a data management tool uh, called Navigator, you know, the tool for provisioning on the cloud and so on. So it's it's kind of grown, but the the basic thesis of uh, of an a, large and interesting open source platform uh, plus um, uh, adjacent management has been the same for, I think, since, you know, 2009. Has the Hadoop, as, do, do you think, do you worry that the Hadoop, well, I should, worry is probably the wrong word, but do you think about the fact that Hadoop as a service may shoehorn you into a certain category uh, if the world moves in the direction of streaming? So, I mean, Hadoop, it really, at this point, encompasses streaming. So, a good example is uh, today, if you use our, our product, you can do streaming through something called Spark Streaming, which is a streaming interface to Spark. And we've been shipping Spark. We've been, we've been funding the development of it for, I don't know, six years or so. Uh, Matei Zahari, the creator of Spark, was our, our first engineering intern. Um, and uh, we've been shipping it for a while. We have a lot of customers using it. And streaming is one of the core use cases 
uh, um, we see for Spark. So obviously the kind of interactive and in, in memory analytics is, is one piece. But I, I think there's probably you know a couple dozen people using it just dedicated for streaming. And we've been shipping that for years. So um, you know, streaming is, is you know when I, I again when we think about this platform, Hadoop was really the kernel of it, and Hadoop really started with kind of one workload being batch. But that concept of having a shared data pool of data plus multiple workloads on the data um, has stayed the same. And every year we add more workloads. So we added you know interactive search, we added interactive SQL, you know we added streaming, we added interactive memory analytics, and so on. And so that's that's the beauty of, of Hadoop is that it's we're you know we have this kind of uh, just architecture, it's, you, know, you think of it like a database and that you put your data in, it allows you to you know, store, process, and query it. But it's really architected like an operating system. So I can, you know, I can have multiple file system options. If I swap out the file system, I don't have to you know, replace my processing engines. I can add a new processing engine without throwing out my metadata repository and my storage. And, and so if you think of a database as a vertically integrated, tightly coupled system where the storage and processing and query language and metadata repository are all bundled into one thing, you don't really get to decouple them. In our platform, you can decouple them, and it's beautiful because then you can swipe. If a new component for processing comes along, you don't have to throw out the rest of your stack. You know, you don't have to rethink the way that you store data, ingest it, secure it, and so on. And so you kind of get this competitive dynamic where the, all these open source projects, you know, and we normally have something called the rule of three. There's typically at least three open source projects competing for a given type of spot in the platform. Um, and that's great. That, that competition allows them, you know, to to improve over time, and we can pick the best ones. And and people, because it's an open source platform, people can choose, um, you know, components that are not part of the platform, and it still interoperates. So, could you describe an example of that rule of three? Yeah. So, if you, if you take a look at, um, uh, you know, uh, is that like on the streaming, like on the streaming level, would be like Spark Storm. Samza, or are you yeah, saying on a higher level than that? No, 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 that's a that's a perfect example. So Sparkstorm, Samza, and there's you know I think a couple a uh, couple others you know as well. But um, uh, that you know that's that's a perfect example of it. Okay. Um, and so in ter- in terms of the streaming versus batch thing, I want to understand that a little better. Well, in, no streaming is you can do batch in a streaming fashion. So streaming and batch aren't necessarily oh, okay. are 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 uh, complementary things. So you know, stream processing is just saying, you know, it, uh, often when people talk about batch, they're really conflating a couple things. So one is that you ingest your data in batches, um, and so uh, most data actually is streaming data. So if you think, just take like the point of sale transactions from a large retailer. It's you know, it's, transactions are happening all the time. People are swiping their credit cards. It's a stream. It's a stream of transactions. Now we often batch that. So for example, a store might collect all the data from all the POS point of sale machines in that store. And then in a batch, upload all that data for like the last hour or the last you know twelve hours to a central repository, and that repository is then getting batches from all around the world. And then we process those batch of batches, and you know, and now we can, for example, tally up all of the transactions for a given day or, or a given period of time. But the, so the, the the data is actually fundamentally streaming. It's only through the implementation of of, of how we decided to choose to process it that we that we batched it up. Okay. And so to me, streaming means actually processing the data um, in a streamlike fashion. Um, but the unit, how, how coarsely you decide to process it, whether you do it one transaction at a time or 10,000 transactions at a time, like your batch size is, um, is kind of independent. And so, so one of the interesting things about Spark Streaming is they actually implement stream processing just by ratcheting down the batch size so that the batch size is small enough that you're your processing data you know, on the order of seconds. So what you're saying is that streaming and batch are not these orthogonal things, they're just opposite ends along a gradient? Yeah, you can, you can think about it that way. The, I think the, the big, to me, the interesting bit about streaming is um, not, is, is that it's uh, more naturally fits the way data is created. And so to me, it's, it's really more about the architecture of how you're moving data through the system. So the beauty of streaming, you know, obviously it's great to get results faster and that's why uh, at some level it's, it's kind of the opposite of batch in that um, you can, you know, uh, People often evaluate streaming systems in terms of, you know, from the from the uh, time I my business, you know, ingests or creates a piece of data, how long does it take for that data to show up in the dashboard or show up in, you know, I you know I click on something, how long does that intelligence show up, you know, it take to show up in the recommendation engine and so on. And the, the beauty of I think streaming is just it's about trying to remove all the friction so that the pipelines in a data in a in a data system just don't end up kind of with these queues and, and latency. And so you know if you think about something like a user clicking on a website, that click generates a message. 
you know, that click should seamlessly move through the system. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the process of, you know, it, it may be that, uh, you know, it still takes orders of minutes to, to update all the you know, various systems, but we haven't duplicated 50 times and ingested it and then created all this complexity where we now have to like write programming logic or how to deal with various batch files and so on. You know, so, so, so as you move along this gradient, what does the cost structure look like? Like if I want to go from having several of my data ingestion processes being batch to just having this constant updated, constantly updated stream mm-hmm. dashboard uh, you know, beautiful system going. Um, what, like, how many orders of magnitude am I going to have to pay higher in order to get that from the batch, the batch side of the gradient to the streaming side of the gradient? So, I, I mean, I, I don't think it necessarily has to cost anything more. It's just a different architectural choice. So, so for example, we might have some people who are, say, uh, you know, bulk exporting data from a data warehouse into uh, Hadoop and, and HDFS and then processing it. Um, uh, and, that, and that's one metaphor. And um, uh, you know, for example, they, they, uh, another, another one is someone is using Kafka, which is a pub sub messaging system, and then processing the messages that come off of Kafka with Spark Streaming. You know, that, that doesn't cost any more. I mean, you're just you're using a different combination of of projects in the platform, but it's it's not fundamentally more expensive. It's just a different it's a different way of architecting it. Um, and in in the I guess one of the to go back to the points of the platform. Um, it's totally valid. Uh, both are totally valid processing models. So there are a lot of places that are batched that probably should be streaming. You know, they were just batched because there are ancillary reasons that cause them to be batched. So, for example, one of the most common reasons that data is batch processed is the the admin of the data warehouse says, "Oh, you know what? Like, this is a precious resource, and I'm going to control when the data is exported from the system." So I've got you know. 500 business users who have a mission critical function, it's great that you want to analyze the data in the system, but I'm going to do a batch export of the data in this warehouse, you know, at midnight or 9 p.m. when my users aren't using it, um, rather than you pulling it in real, like rather you versus you doing change data capture and pulling in every change to that data warehouse as it happens. And so, you know, uh, you know, that's really a business decision to choose to prioritize kind of protecting that precious, expensive resource versus doing a streaming model. We, we support both models, and it's really, and that's the beauty of it. It's, you know, the business chooses what's the, the right model for them. And sometimes it's a streaming one, sometimes it's, it's a batch model. So Cloudera has a really interesting model of contributing to open source where they, well, maybe you could just describe how Cloudera's interaction with the open source community. Yeah, sure. So we're, we're one of them, I mean, I think the, the macro level point is, you know, we're a huge contributor to the open source community. If you look at the 20 some odd uh, projects in the stack, I think we founded 13 of them. Uh, you know, 75, 80% of our engineering uh, time goes into writing open source code. I mean, the, the fundamental, you know, what we, we were the first company to shoot and ship a Hadoop distribution. Um, we're the first company to ship Spark. We're the first company to build a low latency uh, open source uh, SQL and Hadoop system. So, you know, we've, uh, we've been of leading in the open source space for a while and actually growing substantially uh, the portion of our, our code base that's, that is open source because fundamentally the plat, you know, for us the platform is 100% open source and, we, um, and, and the capabilities of the platform grow every year. So we keep adding projects, we keep creating projects. Um, and so o- open source is, is what you know, 75 to 8% of our engineers do every day. We're a you know, platinum level sponsor of the Apache Software Foundation. Many of us, uh, myself included, are actually uh, members of the uh, I'm a PMC of the Apache Do Project at the ASS. And many of us work in the open source uh, community. Um, and then we, in, and that obviously behooves us as a company because we fundamentally ship an open source platform. So if you want to say, you know, go to a large financial services company and say, hey, yeah, we're going to help you, you know, take this uh, platform in production to do better fraud detection. You know, you want to know that people behind the platform understand how it works and, you know, can, uh, you know, address roadmap gaps that you have, fix critical bugs in a matter of hours. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a really, you know, uh, building open source is just a fundamental part of the business. And so how does Cloudera decide what open source projects to contribute to? So some of, you know, we have a mix of things that, you know, we're, there's times where we see gaps and we'll create a project because we don't see something that's in the ecosystem. Um, and there are other, other examples where there's just projects in the ecosystem that, uh, that are great and we contribute to those. And so it's really more of a function of, you know, we have a vision of, of what we want in our platform. And I talked about the kind of the shared data layer of multiple workloads. 
Um, and so you can kind of flesh out what that looks like. And there are cases where, you know, there are existing projects where because, you know, a, a, a great example is Kafka. LinkedIn uh, had this problem, um, built a really nice uh, system to do it, open sourced it. Uh, we started using it and contributing into it. We recently, you know, one of our developers became a, a committer on the project. Um, you know, we had 40 some odd customers running it um, uh, before we officially added support on the platform. So we were already kind of working with it. Um, but, you know, for us, it was a you know combination of there's a gap in, in the platform. Um, it's a project that customers, developers at our customers want to use, right? So the developers at these various companies were choosing Kafka. Um, and again, that's the beauty of the platform. They're using Kafka with CDH before CDH had Kafka because it's, you know, that's how open source works. Um, and then they, you know, they wanted uh, us, you know, we got feedback from them that this is something that they kind of considered to be part of our platform and they wanted to consume as part of it. And we thought there were a lot of, uh, it made a lot of sense too, just because it integrated so nicely with a, a, not just, you know, one or two things, but a lot of the things we were doing. So it's, you know, it's a combination of, you know, is it, is it a gap in the platform? You know, we don't want to have three different variants of everything in the platform. So is, is it a gap? Is it something that has an active developer community that, that looks to be thriving? You know, does it look like it's going to be a standard? Like, you know, for example, when we ship Spark, you know, within a couple quarters, every other Hadoop distrib distribution decided to ship Spark. You know, and so we try to pick things where we can try to get, um, you know, uh, other companies to adopt it. Because, again, we want the open source. We don't want the, you know, the platform to be unique to us. Uh, we want to have active adoption of, of all the components in the platform. So we, so we care about the ecosystem. We care about uh, adoption, for example, not just other Hadoop vendors, but ISVs um, uh, and, and other partners. You know, we want them to build against it. What is an ISD? ISV? ISV, independent software vendor. So, okay. so uh, companies that are writing software that works with our platform. Okay. So that could be a BI tool, an ETL tool. It could be an application, for example, like a... Amdocs, which is uh, does billing systems for telcos. You know, they our product is embedded in their product. You know, we want them to use the capabilities in our product as we add them. So there's a number of factors. Long winded way of saying that there's a number of factors that go into that. And is it ever like Cloudera management decides by fiat we need a bunch of engineers to jump on this, or is it more of an organic process where you have engineers in the company that are saying? Whoa, we need we should be doing this, and they just migrate towards the pro oh, it, towards the project. It tends to come it tends to come bottom up. A lot of um, part in a big. Part of that is just we're a very engineering heavy organization, right? I mean, again, I think the open source platform at this point has five, six million lines of code. This is for a company over 900 employees, which isn't small, but it's, you know, that's a huge product given the size of the company. And so, again, you know, we, there were projects that we created because there are gaps, you know, like whether it's Avro or Impala, um, Hue, and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, typically those projects actually come bottom up from from engineering. So it's it's not that management isn't aware of the gaps. This is that engineers have are pretty you know uh, prescriptive about what the gaps are and what they want to do for them. Um, and so um, you know, for example, uh, you know we've you know actually this is part of my job where we look at those projects. Um, you know, when they're very early, you know, we know the community. Um, and so the decision to put it into the product is normally kind of a foregone conclusion. Like I said, we've been working with Spark for years before we decided to ship it as part of the product. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't kind of like, a, you know, we all got in a room at one time and said, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this. It was something that we um, had kind of been growing um, incrementally. It, it's funny, I actually think this happens at proprietary companies too. You just don't see it because you don't have visibility into the technology they're building in-house, right? It might take two or three years to develop something before they launch it. For us, that's just more visible because these projects are out there, um, you know, uh, getting getting um, uh, attention and being used, and that's great because again, it really de-risks um, it really de-risks the product decisions, right? So Kafka, you know, wasn't something we had to say, oh, build this and maybe it will work. And do, do users like it? No, it already had a really awesome user in LinkedIn. You know, evaluating the technology, uh, really defining some of the initial requirements. We had customers who were adopting it. You know, using it with our platform, kind of early adopters before it was built into the product. So it, you know, really, uh, it gives us a lot of insight into how it's going to work, what the gaps are. You know, so we've been focusing a lot on security for Kafka because that was something that you know the, that the people of LinkedIn weren't working on, but it was something that was critical to our customers. Um, so and, and so, so a product like Kafka. So this this is a good segue into uh, a conversation about about other managed big data providers. So Kafka. Um, there was recently, a, well, I, actually, I don't know how recent it was started. Con, Confluent, yeah. Confluent is, is, a, yeah. is a Kafka company. Exactly. What is the integration process like for if somebody's, if I'm a Hadoop customer uh, and my platform is not using Kafka, or I'm using my own Kafka and I want to migrate to Confluent's version of Kafka? 
What is that process like? I mean, if you look at you know Confluence uh, build of Kafka or Clatter's build of Kafka, they're all based on the on a given Apache release. Uh, or or we have customers who are running Kafka in house because there you know there was no one providing a, a aside from the Kafka project itself, no one providing a build of Kafka. You know that again, that's the beauty of of open source, right? It's not you know we might have some patches, uh, you know, based on bug fixes. You know, excuse me, they're Delta from a release. Uh, Confluent may have some too. You know, the open source project releases new releases, but fundamentally, it's Apache Kafka, and so uh, there, it's not. You know, it's not very hard to switch between uh, you know different different builds of it. And so, I have a question about uh, a broad software development. So, I think like software development practices, uh, like like the word agile, right, is kind of um, it's a the word agile came into use probably. Uh, you know, lagging the actual implementation of Agile by some companies. So I'm curious if there are any interesting or unorthodox software engineering practices within Cloudera, uh, you know, by, by the same token, like, like what are you guys doing in terms of software engineering that maybe doesn't get written about much? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the, the biggest differences between us and, like, a traditional platform company is because we're, uh, because we have an open source platform, there isn't one methodology for the product, right? So, you know, we build software uh, uh, in in one way for one project, and another project with another team might do it slightly differently uh, because, again, it's another it's another project. And so, there is some commonality between you know cloud era development, but there is a bit that's kind of per per project as well. Um, in in general, you know, I think the agile methodology applies a lot less to platform technology than to applications. So, for you know. Uh, if, if you think about features that we're doing, like, um, oh, you know, should we encrypt data? You don't need to do Agile for that. You, oh, every two <laughs> weeks, should we revisit whether we want to encrypt data? You know, maybe the requirements will change. No, you, you're going to want to encrypt it. Like, I can guarantee that we're going to want to encrypt all the data, and I don't need to revisit that decision every two weeks. Uh, you know, Agile makes a lot of sense when I think you have, you know, kind of contract-type work in a, uh, an application where the user may credibly come back and say, oh, this was important, and now this is important. You know, in a platform, that's less important. Like, we know we have, for example, performance goals or feature caps. Uh, we can confidently look out, you know, two, three, four quarters out and say what those are. So, for example, should we support Red Hat version 7? Absolutely. I don't, I don't need to revisit that decision every two weeks. So, so we're, I think, platform technology, you know, both within Cloudera but also outside, um, you know, it might be agile in that we're developing it incrementally. We're, you know, we're building it, we're shipping it, we're releasing, we're getting feedback. Like, like we're absolutely not waterfall where we're, you know, not providing the software to our end user, you know, after for after two years. So we're, we're, we're constantly doing, uh, we're constantly shipping, we're constantly getting feedback. But in terms of what we build, like we're not, we're not really, uh, I don't think anyone in, in kind of who does platform technology is, you know, whether that's Cisco or VMware or us or, or not, not really does agile like that sense. Okay, so Cloudera's business model is this con- combination of open source contribution and then some sense of closed source mechanisms for interacting with that open source technology. And there are plenty of companies that adopt something, some sort of business strategy that looks something like this. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned Red Hat in different contexts, but that was kind of maybe the originator of this like combination of open source and closed source. But, um, you know, now we're getting to like the extreme of, you know, we have Tesla open sourcing some of its patents. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you draw the line between what is useful technology to open source and what should remain closed source? Yeah. For, for us, it's simple. The platform is open source uh, and the management is proprietary. That's, uh, you know, we do not believe, uh, you know, we just don't think customers are going to adopt uh, proprietary platforms, uh, nor nor should they. They it just you know where you store your data, how you process it, query it, etc. Um, that just doesn't make sense uh, to um, uh, to have proprietary. You know, you're just going to get out competed. Um, and if you look at the you know if you take a look at the technologies that are that are kind of really getting a lot of investment and created by you know, whether it's open source projects created by the internet economy like a LinkedIn, a Twitter, a Facebook, a Yahoo, etc. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've done for ages, this is actually one of the earliest strategic decisions that we made, is that we're trying to build the technology that makes this consumable by enterprises in production, right? And so, you know, if you're Yahoo and you can back up a truck to, a, you know, the various CS departments and hire, you know, 30, 50, 100 people every year, yeah, you can consume this stuff, run it in scale and, you know, build, you know, they all build custom infrastructure for configuration, deployment, monitoring, and so on. 
You know, Citibank doesn't want to do that. <laughs> In fact, very few com- very few uh, global 2500 enterprises want to do that. So we focus on building enterprise software to make the core platform technology uh, consumable by, by those enterprises. And that's the stuff that's not being, there's no open source development in that area by their traditional large internet companies. And so that, that's kind of the, the dichotomy. And so it's, it's also, it's, you know, it's historically been a gap, right? Like, you know, our, our project was originally core CDH. It was hard to configure deployment, man, manage, and manager. Why? Because they'd all this, you know, they built all this stuff, but, uh, you know, there, no one had built um, kind of pieces for the other other bits. So that's that's the bits that you know that we built. How much is this a leading indicator of the way other industries are going to go? Like, is Frito Lay eventually going to out like open source their their factory technologies? Is John Deere going to open source how their tractors work? Yes, yeah, so, I mean the, it depends on if you're talking about software or or kind of things outside the software realm. I Both. Mean, I think, yeah, I mean I, the the. If you, if you zoom back, basically what we're talking about is saying, you know, there's a set of, there's a set of things that we develop, um, and we have a trade-off. We can make that thing unique to us, um, and we can be the only ones working on it, or we can uh, co-develop this technology with a group of people, uh, and it will no longer be neat, unique to us. And so, you know, going back to, like, why do we have this business model? And we're actually relatively unique in this business model. On the one hand, you have, you know, proprietary software companies who their technology is, uh, is completely unique to them, right? The only you know, place you can get Splunk is from Splunk. Um, and on the other hand, you have 100% uh, you know, open source companies which don't typically stick around for very long because there's nothing unique, right? IBM can go and say, oh yeah, that I, I have all of that too because it's 100% open source, right? Um, and so what we've tried to do is have a balance where we're saying, well, we're, you know, we're gonna have an open platform um, and because that platform needs to be developed by a community of people, right? We don't believe one company uh, has all the resources uh, necessary to outcompete the aggregate open source ecosystem for platform technology, and I think that analogy to kind of answer your question applies to other industries as well. So there, there are other parts of other industries where the people producing the technology say, you know what, you know, historically one company, um, you know, might have funded all of this, but you know, there's five of us who, you know, we don't directly monetize that technology. And if the five of us work together, we can probably do a better job than any one of us will do alone. And that's actually going to drive this adjacent thing that we do monetize. And so anytime you have that dynamic, you're seeing people effectively open source, you know, uh, what it, whatever it is they're doing. And, and in the software world, you know, that's that's the future. It's a combination of uh, a, you know, a powerful open source standard plus some proprietary technology. So look at GitHub, right? It's Git, which is this open source project, a very powerful standard that we all use. But GitHub is a proprietary thing that helps make Git actually usable to, to lots of people. You know, you can share uh, and collaborate on projects and so on. And it's the same thing with us, right? It's a, it's a powerful open source standard, but there has to be something unique to the company because otherwise you have, you know, you have no... Um, you know, you're, you want to provide, you don't just want to distribute a free thing. You want your engineers to be working on making that thing more valuable and usable. And that, that, that's, for example, what's great about GitHub. They didn't just, you know, hack on Git more. They made, uh, they thought about how to make Git more adaptable to the, the rest of the world. And that's made Git itself a lot more valuable. Right. right? And that's what we've been doing with Hadoop is we, you know, we, again, 75% of our engineers are working on that open source platform. But the mission of the company, you know, if we want to help organizations leverage the power of all their data, we have to not just hack on the open source projects. We've got to make all of that technology accessible to those enterprises. Yeah, I love that generalization. So, um, the first week of Software Engineering Daily was about JavaScript, and there was this motif that I encountered, which was the amount of collaboration among large companies. There was teamwork between Microsoft and Google on Angular 2.0, and there was teamwork between Facebook and Apple. They were working on React together. Um, and so I'm curious, if is this story of collaboration, like the increase of collaboration, is this an industry-wide thing that's happening or is this just something that's always been there or like what do you think is the continuing story of collaboration among large tech companies so you know um yeah there's i think there's two forms of collaboration there's collaboration among the producers of the technology um and there's also collaboration among the consumers and the producers of the technology and those i think those are we often focus on collaboration of the producers, but collaborations of the producers and consumers is kind of interesting as well. So for example, when Kafka, sorry, when LinkedIn first, uh, you know, uh, published 
um, you know, open source Kafka and published it out there, they had, you know, consumers of the technologies that started to use it and, and hack on it and whatnot. And so there's an interesting collaboration between the producers and the consumers. And then now we've got collaborations between kind of multiple producers. And um, that is, you know, that is, uh, I think that's reflective of a larger product development trend, which is saying, you know, let's not sit in a cave uh, and kind of build this one thing in isolation and, and, and kind of throw it out in the world. You know, systems are so big and complex that let's think about kind of breaking up, them up into individual pieces and being far more iterative with how we uh, launch and, and um, integrate those pieces. And so I think anytime you see an ecosystem that has, that's a large complex ecosystem that you can decompose into individual pieces, you're going to start to see this working model of let's stop getting, you know, uh, these giant, like, let's not produce those things by giant corporations um, working in isolation. Let's produce those things by decomposing the system into constituent parts and then having collaboration and competition on those parts. So, so, so we talked about, uh, we talked about Spark. Like, I, there were two, two core uh, engineering uh, principles that I was that I was interested in g- coming into this interview. The first one was streaming. We already discussed that. The second one is containerization. Mm-hmm. How is Cloudera using containerization services like Docker? So it's, it's funny. Containers. Um, I've been. I, I spent half a decade at VMware before the last six years at Cloudera, and so uh, containers and virtual machines are kind of in my uh, in my DNA. Um, and, and containers are something that you know fundamentally we've been doing uh, from day one, and we've been doing them because it's it's a technology. That really Google uh, had been pioneering recently, and you know Hadoop is based on a lot of Google, uh, Go- you know Google's GFS and MapReduce papers. And the fundamental unit of allocation from day one in MapReduce has been a Linux container. So when you you know we take one way to look at Hadoop is we take a cluster, we chop it up into containers, and then we allocate those containers to jobs. So uh, you know the, the uh, MapReduce code base has had the Linux container executor for ages. And so what Docker's really been doing is making Linux containers more usable to developers by allowing them to compose environments in those containers. We've been making containers usable by developers by just allowing them to write, for example, a Hive job, and it runs, we automatically run it on a bunch of containers. We take care of setting up the containers. You know, we've been managing C groups for, uh, of those containers for ages, and Clutter Manager makes that very easy. Okay, so that's, that's really clarifying. Has, has Docker made containerization easier for Cloudera? So one of the things, so we've been distributing our software in Docker images, and what Docker has been really uh, great for is making our te- our uh, uh, our software more consumable quickly by a developer. So so we've always published a virtual machine image with our full stack when we do a release, so that someone can you know run the VM on their on their uh, client and start playing around with the technology, you know, connecting it to a remote cluster or whatnot. Um, we started publishing more and more of our of our software in Docker images as well. So because that's really the way uh, a lot of developers want it. So if you want to kick the tires on Impala, connect it to a remote cluster, you know you can just pull the the, the Docker Impala image and poof, there you go. And that's a, that's nicer than pulling uh, the virtual machine image. Um, we we also use Docker quite extensively internally for testing, right? So if you just want to launch, you know, an H based cluster. Um, you know, on, on one machine to try to test the various configuration options, you don't really need to run it on five different machines or five, uh, um, you know, physical pieces of hardware to do a lot of the kind of uh, basic testing that requires launching a cluster. So we can launch an H-based cluster on one machine with 20, we can launch 20 clusters with 20 different parts of the configuration space, tear them down, we can do that very quickly, much faster than we could launch them on a VM on-premise or a VM on the cloud. Right, so, so I, sh- I should have said this first, but maybe for our listeners who don't know as much about containerization versus VMs, you could contrast how heavy a VM instance versus a Docker image is. Yeah, Yeah, so there's a continuum. You know, if you think of a raw Linux process or or a raw operating system process on one side, uh, and you can think of the other as a full virtual machine on the other, there's there's a continuum between those two spaces um, depending on how much you share and how isolated you are. So, for example, a virtual machine uh, is completely isolated um, and uh, you know it provides the full abstraction of a machine. A raw Linux process, you know, is has the weakest form of uh, of isolation and sharing. So if, you know, if you think like in Linux, if you want to create a process versus a thread, it's the exact same system call. It gives you ex- the exact same schedulable entity. One just shares an address space 
You know, a thread is just two processes that sh sharing an address space in Linux. You know, there are other operating systems where that's not true. But a container is just a Linux process with additional isolation layered onto it. So if you think of, you know, a, a raw Linux process, then a raw Linux process running in a Linux container, like, you know, running in C groups, um, you know, all, all the way up to Docker, you know, Docker is actually just an interface for using the underlying Linux container technology. It's not adding... Uh, you know, it, it's using all that underlying Linux container technology. It's not. It's not. Add, it's adding a lot of stuff, but it's really more about the, around the accessibility, not around the raw technology. And a virtual machine is just a um, a more fully blown version of that. And so, I think one of the things that we we've known forever is that there's certain environments. Uh, you know, um, there are pros and cons to all these um, to all these environments. Like there's things where you want to use raw processes, there's things where you might want to use containers, there's things where you want to use virtual machines, there's things where you want to use bare metal, which I, which I guess is the same as the, the raw processes. And there's a time and place for all of these. And what Docker has really done, I think, is, which has been great, is show is really make the, the space of containers accessible to a lot more people. So you know, we had made containers accessible effectively by hiding them and uh, using them as an implementation detail. Docker's really allowed uh, developers to harness containers uh, directly, and I think that there's, they've kind of proved that there's just a lot of uh, demand and value in doing that. Okay, that's great. So Moore's Law has been used to articulate the speed at which technology is exponentially increasing, but it seems, and I could be wrong about this, but it seems like an increasingly contrived benchmark if we develop a new technology that allows us to break up our tasks in a more logical fashion or that uses resources more effectively, that has nothing to do with increased processor speed, but it does result in a technological advance. So do you have any, I mean, first of all, do you agree with this? And do you have any suggestions for different benchmarks that people can use to identify how fast our world is exponentially advancing? Yeah, so when, so a common misconception is with Moore's law is that it's related to processor speed. Oh, it's like the size, right? So is that, it's so size. What, what Moore's law? Oh no, how many transistors? Yes, okay, it's sorry. transistor density. So every eighteen months, we're doubling the number of transistors. Historically, that increase in density uh, was used to, um, among other things, increase the clock frequency of the processors, which is what you think of as processor speed. Um, but it also has other like. Uh, Moore's law is also why memory is getting, uh, you know, the amount of memory we can shove in a machine is is, is uh, doubling every every eighteen months as well. So so Moore's law has a number of benefits, and, and what you're noticing, which is accurate, is that the clock frequency of chips has not been doubling every eighteen months. So you know, I, I recently ordered a bunch of machines, and I think they had three point four gigahertz. Uh, you know, they're rated at, at three point four gigahertz, and I could buy a three point four gigahertz machine years ago. Um, so uh, now. It's that you know, it's 18 cores a chip, <laughs> um, uh, a socket, and you, know, you have two sockets. So we're you know, the number of cores is actually going up every 18 months. But I think you know, the the big shift that you're seeing is that um, there's a lot, and this is this is something that we benefit from at Clutter, obviously being a parallel uh, data processing system. Is you know, uh, the the frameworks that win in the future are the frameworks that can leverage that parallelism because the chips aren't getting a whole lot faster from an individual thread basis, but we are. Again, I just bought a machine with 36 cores, you know, 72 threads. That's that's nuts, right? That's more uh, capacity in one one U machine than the entire rack of uh, of power at Google had when they published the Google Papers. Wow. So, okay. So just just think about that. So that's awesome. But the only way you can harness that technology is through parallelization. So I was yeah you know, I was reading an um, interesting uh, talk or was that um, someone. Um, uh, had, had written about the, the garbage, the news garbage collector uh, that Go, the, the programming language Go has, you know, that uh, Google's been developing. And, you know, it's the same thing where they said, well, you know, in Java, their idea of parallelism was, you know, relatively limited, but, you know, we see the world now, like, you know, as just being massively, massively parallel, and that's going to change a number of things. You might have thousands and thousands of Go routines running on one machine at the same time, where Java was saying, oh, I mean, 100 threads, that was a lot, right? And so, same same with us, right? Like, when we, you know, we have customers that are running 10,000 tasks on a cluster constantly. There are 10,000 tasks always running on the cluster, and so that's just the world we live in today. And the, the beauty of, you know, I believe we're kind of on the right side of technology history in that, you know, everyone is going to, even a single machine is going to be able to support thousands of tasks. So, you know, today, you know, maybe we're doing that on, say, a hundred, uh, you know, a server cluster, but, you know, that's going to be a five server cluster and so on. So we, you know, this is a dimension that, that we're already kind of aligned with and we, and we increasingly do work 
um, to support because that parallelism is just going up and up and up. So has the technology, has the real technology world, like at least from cloud, from where Cloudera stands, have we become decoupled from the past notion where, uh, oh yeah, we've got this every 18 months, we're going to double and all, everybody in the industry is going to move in lockstep towards this, you know, the, the, you, you know this narrative, right? Yeah. Like the every 18 months, so, ex, you know, this stuff doubles and everybody else in the industry works in lockstep to synchronize around that yeah. time frame. I, I mean, I think we've already moved off of it in the sense that client work has all moved uh, to the browser and mobile. So they don't care about, uh, you know, they, they just, it's just not, you know, back in the kind of Wintel era, you know, P, the client world really deeply cared about getting faster machines. And, and as you've seen, you know, PC shipments continue to continue to drop. You know, Windows has to, Microsoft has to give away the latest version of Windows for free to consumers, right? Uh, Apple does this as well, right? The, the market value of proprietary operating systems has dropped to zero. <laughs> um, and so the client world already off, has been off that world for a while. On the server side, and the server side now is, is kind of the old school server side plus the server side that's been generated from everyone on the client moving to, you know, the, you know mobile and web, which puts a lot of demand on us on the server side. You know, we've been living in this world uh, for a while, which has said, you know, hey, you know, as applications move to that kind of uh, that model driven by these new types of clients, you know, we've had to scale out on the server side for a while. And so uh, scale out has kind of been, been our uh our, our, our shtick for, I don't know, I feel like a decade um, uh, plus now. And, and so in that world, you know, it's really well, you know, it's, you have a couple of knobs. It's, you know, how beefy is every machine, how many machines you have. And so it's kind of one half dozen another, right? If I have, if I buy 100 machines with 18 cores per socket, or if I buy 50, mach you know, uh, 200 machines with half that, you know, it's really about balancing this holistic set of compute, networking, and memory. You care less about what an individual machine looks like. So the tech bubble is discussed a lot, and I'm not going to ask whether or not you think we're in a downturn. Um, but I'm assuming you, th or I'm sorry, not that we're in a downturn, whether you think there's some probability of a downturn in the future. I'm not going to ask that question because I hear that question asked a lot. But I'm guessing you think there's there's some probability that there's some sort of bubble type behavior and that there will be some sort of larger scale downturn. If that were to happen, if the worst potential future happened in terms of like Cloudera's business mm -hmm. and a bunch of customers suddenly pulled out, I'm curious from a engineering standpoint of handling the situation in terms of reallocating the overabundance and processing power that you would have. If, if a bunch of customers just suddenly pulled out what would you do? So we, I mean, uh, we were founded right before the financial crisis of 2008. Oh, wow. So you've done this before. Yeah, we've, so this isn't something I have to hypothesize about. So we, uh, we closed a round of funding uh, right, I think, a day before Lehman Brothers went under. Um, so, uh, and by the way, this is the second time I've lived this. My first, I started uh, working as a software engineer in 1999, uh, right before the dot-com crash. I was working in, uh, at a startup in New York City. And, and then later, a, a, consult, a very small consulting company. Um, and uh, we had, a, I, you know, that I was at the company for a, a year and a bit, and we had a great business replatforming all of these companies from, you know, expensive proprietary like Sun Hardware, Oracle databases, um, you know, proprietary application servers. And I started, uh, you know, with these other guys, um, taking them on a lamp stack. Again, this was in 2000. Um, and our business was awesome. It was uh, that, you know, we were, we were uh, making money hand over fist and just couldn't, you know, uh, uh, could, could go to all of these companies. And, you know, the, just the order of magnitude cost difference that you had between, you know, a Sun E10K running an Oracle box versus, a, you know, a 50,000 computer from Dell plus MySQL plus a Red Hat subscription. I mean, it was, uh, it paid, it, you know, our projects just paid for themselves immediately. Um, you know, just in the, ne the next license renewal. So, uh, open source technology benefits tremendously from uh, from downturns. So, uh, you know, if you look at what we so, so, you know, if you look at us as a as a company now, you know, our if you look at say on a per you know pro you know cost to process a terabyte basis, um, we're an order to uh, one order of magnitude or more cheaper than traditional systems. So, you know, you get people who are using traditional systems at say. You know, twenty five, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars a terabyte. You know, a terabyte, and we're coming in with a system. You know, where one machine can hold 
you know, 16, 18, 24 raw terabytes, of, or sorry, terabyte, logical terabytes of storage, even more raw, 36, 48 terabytes raw, in one machine that's licensed on a per node basis. So they can have more drives and they don't pay us anymore. So you're saying this is what happened in the Lehman Brothers time. Like you were surprised by, do you got more customers? Oh, just, well, I, so, I mean, anytime there's a crash, I actually think it's a great time to, to, to start a company. Um, just because it's the talent pool, uh, is you get less competition from the talent pool, and you get companies that are interest, more interested in being creative and trying to. Use no, certainly, that. I'm not disputing that the the macro effect uh, is good yes. and is interesting and is like ultimately positive. But what I'm curious about is, from an engineering perspective, if all of a sudden you lost a ton of customers mm-hmm. and you had all the spare compute resource. What would you do with that overabundance? Well, we don't. So we actually don't have. I mean, we use the public cloud quite a bit. You know, we have a oh. we, we have a data center. Uh, we we've you know got thousands of machines in a data center in San Jose, but we don't host the software for our customers. They they run they pri- pri- so primarily our customers run our software on their premise. Uh, we know we they they, okay. might, they might launch our software for them in the cloud, but we don't host um, uh, the software for the customers. And so, um, you know, their their usage of it is that we have we incur no cost there. And obviously, I mean, the co- the cost of machine, you know, people is exp- are expensive and machines are cheap. So I don't worry about our inventory. And by, and by the way, a typical server, you know, it, the value goes to zero over three years. So you, right. you, know, you mark it down to zero after three years. So, uh, I, so, I, so even if you had to scale down, it wouldn't be a problem. Oh, You've got three yeah, yeah. three years of, of yeah, yeah. burden. Yeah. Oh, oh and, we, and we use a tremendous amount of, of public cloud too. So we, you know, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of elasticity in our internal infrastructure. We, yeah, we that, that's not something I worry about. Interesting. Okay. Um, so there's a number of like newer data visualization tools. Um, you know, you've got Cloud Era. There's also like Tableau and Palantir uh, and some other ones. What does the future of work look like when we have people who are empowered to make much more refined judgments from data? And you have increasingly or decreasingly engineering type people who can make in- interesting judgments from that data. And so I think, you know, we've, um, there are companies that have been providing rich analytical tools to kind of end user analysts uh, for a while. So if you look at any insurance firm or financial services firm, They've been doing this uh, for probably half a century, right? So if you think about like an, an um, you know, an, uh, an Allstate or a, a bank is doing fraud, um, they've been doing sophisticated statistical analysis of their data, driven by the business for a long time. Uh, one of the macro trends is that that's becoming a lot more accessible. So rather than you know this kind of precious analytical tools that are very expensive, only being offered to people with a kind of a deep analytical background. Um, you know, the, the BI revolution in, in the 90s was about making a lot of this visualization more uh, directly applicable to the business. And so that is, you know, Tableau is just the most recent. I mean, there's uh, Tableau is a recent entrant to the BI market, but the BI market is not a new one. Um, you know, uh, every major database company uh, has pretty much had a BI offering um, uh, for a while. Um, and, and what's, you know, we're, we're kind of continuing in you know, the, the macro uh, level change there has been self-service BI, which is taking BI kind of from this uh, small domain of people who it's, you know, making it, uh, instead of making it accessible to a small number of people, trying to make the data of the business accessible to as many of those people as possible. So you can imagine, you know, instead of uh, the executive team, you know, so for example, we, you know, we in our meetings, uh, you know, use Tableau to look at a bunch of our, our, our data uh, that we used to make decisions about the business. Um, but now we've, we, you know, that accessible, that data isn't just accessible to me, it's accessible to, um, you know, everyone within Clutter. And so we're trying, you know, what we're doing internally is the same thing that's going on uh, outside Clutter, which is we're, everyone's trying to make the data more accessible uh, to more parts of the business so that they can benefit from it, right? So, I mean, you know, the, you, know you think, for example, why is Clutter's mission um, to help organizations leverage the power of all their data? It's because the things that we do in life increasingly generate data and can benefit from its analysis, right? And so that that goes from all the data we have uh, about you know internally about how our own systems operate. It goes about how you know external data about how the, the world works. You know whether it's driving a car or you know, managing the temperature in home or fraud or you know booking a flight or selling an ad. Right, all of these are are now tremendous analytics problems. And so, uh, but that, that's, a, it's effectively kind of all in, in this business intelligence umbrella. And they're just, you know, the newer players are just trying to make it more accessible. So what, what Tableau has done, which is great, uh, and they're a great partner of ours. So people often use Tableau to analyze the data in Cloudera. 
Um, you know, Tableau has done a really awesome job at making a very uh, usable and rich in, a tool that lets uh, a broader class of people do kind of interesting uh, visualizations of their data. Um, but there, there's probably, you know, there's uh, Platfora as, an, as another company that, that's done that with uh, Zoom data. You know, we, those are all uh, partners of ours that, that kind of build on top of our platform. So I'm going to start to close off by asking a little more personal career type question. What was your biggest inflection point in your trajectory as an engineer throughout your career? Uh, the biggest inflection point, just in terms of uh, from, from what to what? From... I mean, well, originally I was just thinking from, uh, from I don't know, the most positive inflection point. But oh. I mean, if there was, if it was, if it, would, if you think it would be more interesting for the listeners to talk about a negative inflection point, <laughs> yeah. that's also well, I guess, viable. Yeah. So I've had, you know, um, I'm weird in that I, I always loved uh, kind of math and computer science and art, and so I, I had three majors as an undergrad. I started as a film and television major. I switched to, to studio art and oil painting. Uh, and then I switched to math and, and computer science. And I was in college for three years, and I, I, had, a different major, <laughs> I had a different major every year. And I eventually went to, to grad school um, and uh, to, for a PhD in computer science and dropped out of, after you know getting a master's. I came out to the uh, uh, Bay Area for an internship and just kind of never left. Um, and so you know, I started my career doing application development in the original dot-com boom. I went to grad school, got very interested in systems, and low-level techniques like binary instrumentation, which uh, led me to virtualization and an internship at VMware. Um, I spent a half a decade at VMware working on processor virtualization, which was which was fascinating and just it's an awesome, awesome experience. And one of the things I noticed at VMware was um, the you know that storage was becoming a software problem. So you know VMware was owned by AMC, which was a storage company. And as part of a, you know, as an uh, early um, one of the earlier employees looking at what's now called vSAN. Uh, which is a, a product that VMware built, you know, for effectively a, a storage area network uh, software, you know, uh, implemented software. And so as part of that, I was kind of really looking at, you know, how the storage landscape was changing from kind of an appliance model to a software model. And that's actually um, one of the things, ways that I kind of got back and reconnected with with Hadoop. Um, I had originally studied the, the, the Google GFS and MapReduce papers in grad school, so I was kind of aware of, of the technology already. Um, but then I saw from a, from a business perspective, it just made, to me, I just thought storage was going to become a software uh, practice. And, and all of, you know, the way people were going to store data was going to be through adjacent things. So I'm not going to, you know, instead of buying a filer, you know, we use Box and Dropbox, right? Instead of uh, buying, you know, uh, storage for analytics, we use Hadoop. And, you know, Hadoop does other things. I'm not buying storage when I buy Hadoop, but it does store my data. And so I saw that, you know, the, the kind of the storage market was changing, which really got me interested in, you um, in uh, Hadoop and, and Cloudera, and I joined uh, Cloudera as a you know very early employee, um, kind of through through a connection at, at VMware, and um, and you know started working uh, on the open source platform. I, I uh, led you know at the time our platform team was three people. I led that team until it was around forty some odd people. Had a number of different roles uh, until a year and a half in my current one, and so that you know that's uh, I, I started working on open source. At, Specifically, Linux at, at VMware, and so I was kind of interested in open source. I was, you know, working at open source at Cloudera, and so um, there's just there's been a couple of inflection points in terms of you know uh, you know get, uh, discovering the power of open source, um, you know, discovering the power of virtualization. I mean, when I joined VMware, people thought uh, they said, "Well, maybe VMs are kind of good for test dev, but you know, why would you use them for anything else?" And I thought, you know, VMs were the future. Now, if you look at the cloud, you can't get public resources. You can't get resources on the cloud without getting a virtual machine. It, it's the unit of currency, right? So it sounds more like it was a constant process, oh, yeah. rather it's, than any sharp inflection. Yeah, point. yeah, it, it was a constant. It was a constant process. I mean, one of the things that I've told people before, just in terms of advice, is optimize for learning. There, there's some people who know what they want to do. I mean, I worked with people uh, in previous companies where they could look at binary code on. Uh, on a screen and actually tell you what it did, right? And I very early oh, the like, mate like the Matrix. Yeah, literally, like, like <laughs> the people who are like the Matrix. And I mean, this is like, so I'm something who was you know, I was writing x86 assembly, you know, for that was virtualizing a processor, like code that ran below, you know, kernel level, uh, you know, those running at CPL, what we call CPL zero, which is the lowest privilege of the processor that was you know hosting a kernel, pretty low level stuff, right? Um, and these people, you know, were like literally, you know, could look at a screen and, and see, you know, the binary code. So, you know, when I, I, one of the things that, you know, you know, if you're one of those people, you should do that, you know, and, and that, you know, that, uh, that they're kind of, you know, kind of built for that. 
I was never really, I, I got the impression I never really built for one thing. I would, I always kind of optimize for learning and then work on things that I was really fired up about because then you could work really hard on them and do really well on them. So that to me is, uh, it's been, that, that's been my story, which is kind of, you know, uh, finding things that I'm truly fired up about that I really want to work hard on and do an awesome job at and just, you know, keep, keep iterating. And Great. The, other, the other thing I'll notice, if you join a small company that grows, you will just end up you know, much of what you'll do will be a function of the growth of that company, right? So, I don't know, Cloud Arrow was 10 or 11 uh, people when I joined, um, uh, maybe a bit more, maybe a little less, and, you know, now we're 900. And, you know, the last five or six years has been, you know, what I found interesting, but also a large function of just, you know, anytime you're in a company that's growing that fast, you're, you, there's just going to be a lot of new things, new things going on. So That's great. Okay, well, um, that's a great piece of wisdom to, to close out on. Um, well, Eli Collins, thank you so much for coming on Software Engineering Daily. Thank you so much for having me. It's been yeah, a pleasure. It has been awesome.